Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, November 2nd, marks 20 years of continuous occupation of the International Space Station. And therefore, if you've been born in the last 20 years, that means you've never known a time where there were no humans in space. But I think it's important to recognise that there were many visitors to the ISS and a lot of work done before it was ready for a full-time crew. The first components of the International Space Station had launched in late 1998. Zarya was launched on a Proton rocket and then a few weeks later the Space Shuttle Endeavour delivered the Unity module on STS-88. This was the first time that crew boarded the station, but they couldn't stay because the Space Shuttle could only spend a couple of weeks in orbit at most and the crew couldn't stay behind without a way to return to the Earth. The next crew visited in May of 1999, this was STS-96, and that carried mostly cargo and supplies for outfitting the interior of the station, which was still only the two modules. Now technically it was the first spacecraft to actually dock to the space station because in, in the previous mission they had uh, moved up Unity and then grabbed Zarya with the manipulator arm and locked the two modules together. A year later, STS-101 would deliver another load of supplies on the station and also boost the orbit of the station by 30 kilometers. The modules that were launched were stripped down for mass reasons, so a lot of the shuttle flights early on were bringing up internal supplies and equipment that they would ultimately need to have on the station. Uh, they would also have to perform important jobs relating to the construction, like EVAs to install equipment on the exterior or connect cabling or plumbing or whatever between the different modules. The next actual module to arrive was Zvezda, which again was launched on a Proton rocket in July 2000. This docked autonomously and in August the first Progress spacecraft would dock to the back of Zvezda, carrying things like food and water for the first crew to live in the space station. But they weren't there yet. There was nobody to unload the progress. So, September, we have STS-106. That would again deliver more supplies and do construction work while also unloading the progress. During STS-106, there was a record-breaking EVA where Ed Liu and Yuri Malenchenko had to connect exterior cabling on the Russian end of the station. Uh, and with no airlock in the station, they had to use a shuttle airlock and use tethers and handrails to crawl 30 metres along the exterior of the ISS towards the far end of the station. This took them further than any other astronaut on a tethered EVA. In October 2000, we had STS-92 with the Z-1 truss module, which was an unpressurized module that connects, uh, or it contains important hardware such as the control moment gyros, communications hardware, and it would also be a temporary mounting location for the main solar arrays during construction of the station. Uh, this mission also brought up the third pressurized mating adapter, giving the space shuttle two different places where it could dock, allowing it to move the docking adapters around as modules were added to the station over construction. So by the time we get to October 2000, 20 years ago, five crews had visited the space station on the space shuttle. 34 astronauts and cosmonauts, 27 from the US, 5 from Russia, and one each from Canada and Japan. Over those two years of early assembly, less than one month has had people inside the station, but they'd done all, all the work. They'd had you know, 10 different spacewalks, a lot of unloading, all to make sure that the partially constructed station was ready for long-term occupation. By this point, the station had a mass of about 75 tons, not in counting you know, dot spacecraft that were docked to it or hardware inside. So anyway, Soyuz TM-31 lifted off from Baikonur on October 31st, 2000, carrying cosmonaut Sergei Krikalev, Yuri Gidzenko, and astronaut William Shepard. This was for a planned four-month stay on board the space station. Krikalev became the first person to visit the ISS twice. He was on STS-88, where he'd entered the space station for the first time simultaneously with NASA astronaut Robert Cabana in a show of international co cooperation. Yuri Kudzenko would be the Soyuz commander, but Bill Shepard would be the ISS commander for what was called Expedition 1. 
Early on, the crew decided to change the call sign of the station to Alpha to make communication with the ground a little less verbose, although the developer of the Russian component argued that Beta was more appropriate since the Russian section did start out as Mir 2. Bill Shepard also kept a captain's log, detailing daily activities, everything from the construction tasks, problems with hardware, to musings on the significance of Expedition 1, and even the movies they watched in space. According to this, the first movie they watched on video CD rather than DVD was The Sixth Sense, and this was chosen in part because one of the cosmonauts thought it might be a sequel to The Fifth Element. These logs make for some interesting reading. There's quite a few redactions to, related to sensitive operations, but you can find them online, although for some odd reason the PDF versions have many sections rendered in Comic Sans, which is of course the only font appropriate for a pioneering document such as this. Sure, some people say that Comic Sans lacks gravitas, but the ISS literally lacks gravity. The movies were delivered on the first progress to deliver an active crew, to an active crew, which arrived on November 18th. This was a Progress M1 variant, which exchanged some of the cargo space for extra fuel, which is used to top up the tanks that fed the thrusters on the Zvezda module. During the final approach, there were technical problems with the guidance system, requiring the crew to perform a manual docking. Expedition 1 conducted the first proper science experiments on the space station. They investigated plasma crystals, where electrically charged dust particles arranged themselves into macroscopic crystal lattices. This was a collaboration between the Russian Space Agency and the Max, uh, Max Planck Institute in Germany. Again, showing the international nature of the station. The crew spent most of their time in the Russian section of the station early on, since the solar panels that, uh, on the international section hadn't been installed yet, so they couldn't heat the Unity module. It was closed off most of the time. Uh, Expedition 1 crew would continue building out the station, of course. While they were um, there, the mass of the space station, excluding the vehicles, uh, likely passed about 100 tonnes, and by the end, the volume, I think, was bigger than Skylab or Mir. During Expedition's one time on the station, they would be visited by three different space shuttles. First, there was STS-97, and that delivered the P-6 truss segment, which was intended to be the most distant part of the port truss, you know, P6, and that supported one set of the solar panels. But without the rest of the truss assembled, they had to attach it to the Z1 truss segment. And from there, they would connect it and it would provide power from the state for the station during construction. The shuttle arrived on 2nd of December, but it didn't open the hatch right away and greet the crew. Instead, the crew of the station and the shuttle remained separated until the 8th of December. They always kept one hatch closed into Unity until uh, the new power system was installed and all the EVAs were complete. When they're doing the EVAs, it was much easier if they could adjust the air pressure on their side without worrying about the rest of the station. They did, however, apparently open up Unity and go in and drop off care packages, leaving them on the doorstep of Expedition 1, you know, so they could enjoy them early. So yeah, uh, the Progress spacecraft also, it was kind of inconveniently located for the shuttle's required docking location. So before the shuttle arrived, they undocked that and backed it off and put it in a chase orbit, parking it about 2,000 kilometers from the station for the duration of the shuttle's visit. Um, returning after the departure you know, to demonstrate that the automated docking systems had actually been solved. Uh, this crew spent New Year's in space and because of an old naval tradition, the first log entry in the New Year was composed as poetry, which is probably the first poetry from space that I've seen written down. The second shuttle to arrive was STS-98, and it brought the Destiny module, which was a major expansion of the US part of the station. Uh, because the pressurized mating adapter number two was on the front of Unity, they had to take that off, store it by attaching it to the Z1 truss, then they could attach Destiny, and then they could take the PMA2 and finally dock it on the front of Destiny. Um, but that expanded the size of the station quite substantially. 
Finally, the third shuttle flight was STS-102, which was mainly a cargo delivery mission, and it carried a number of payload racks for the Destiny module. Now, these were too large to move through either of the docking adapters on the Soyuz or the uh, shuttle adapter. So what they do is instead they put them in the Leonardo multi-purpose module, which they would take with this arm, berth to the station, and then allow the, un, uh, the motion unpacking using the much larger berthing uh, ports. Now, STS-102 also holds the record for the longest spacewalk ever, 8 hours and 56 minutes by James Voss and Susan Helms, which involved lots of exterior cable routing, including you know, disconnecting PMA-3 to allow it to be moved to a new location later. Voss and Helms were also part of Expedition 2, with the third member being Yuri Yusachev, who would become the station commander. The Expedition 1 crew returned to Earth on the space shuttle in the seats vacated by Expedition 2, leaving their Soyuz on the space station to act as an emergency return vehicle for Expedition 2. So Expedition 2 weren't expected to use the Soyuz except in an emergency. In April, a new Soyuz was docked to the space station carrying a crew of three, including Dennis Tito, the first space tourist or private spaceflight participant. And this would spend a week on the station and then return in the Soyuz that had brought Expedition 1. This was how the early crew rotations worked. The Soyuz was primarily there as a lifeboat, while the crew was rotated using the regular space shuttle missions. And new Soyuz lifeboats would be delivered every six months or so by a short-term crew that would stay for like a week or so. And, frequent, and that, of course, meant they frequently had oppor uh, opportunities for private astronauts. Sadly for fans of daily life on the space station, Expedition 2 didn't keep a daily log. Many of the later crews would do things like write regular letters home and publish these. These look a lot like blog posts, but I don't think anybody has ever had the cadence of Bill Shepard's daily logs. I think it's actually worth finishing this video with the last entry in Expedition 1's log as they passed command of the station over to the new crew. Change of command is an ancient naval tradition. The passage of responsibility for mission, welfare of crew, and integrity of vessel from one individual to another. Space Station Alpha has been commissioned in orbit. The service module has been activated. The power element and laboratory module have been brought aboard. A successful resupply mission with Discovery and her crew is complete. Station is at nominal condition. All systems functional and ready to carry out operations. We are on a true space ship now, making her way above the earthly boundary. We are not the first crew to board Alpha or the last to depart, but we have made Alpha come alive. We gave her a name and put substance in the ideas that our crews can work together as equals and our countries as partners, that we may proceed with bolder and more enterprising voyages in space with benefit from our differences and with stronger purpose in our common goals. We pass to your care Alpha's log with the hope that many successful entries are recorded here, that explorations carried out aboard are prodigious and discoveries wondrous. May the goodwill, spirit and sense of mission we have enjoyed aboard endure. Sail her well. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Mm -hmm.